You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Welcome back to Bookstorm Podcast. Book lovers, we're super excited about who we have with us here today because we have Mary Kubica for the second time on Bookstorm. We love when our authors come back to see us again because they know that we love their writing, but this also means they must like us a little bit too. And we're so happy to have you, Mary. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me back. I'm excited to chat with both of you again. Well, we love this new book that we're here to talk about today. She's not sorry, but before we get into it, I want to tell our listeners, as you know, a little bit about your history. Mary Kubica is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of Suspense. Her books have been translated into over 30 languages and have sold more than 5 million copies. Wow. She's a former high school teacher. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Miami of Ohio in history and, of course, American literature. Her novels have been very highly regarded, and I've just got to name a few accolades. They've been selected as Amazon Best Books, um, Library Read Selections, Indie Next Picks, Strand Critic nominations for Best First Novel, Good Read Choice Award nominations, finalists for the Audi Award, and more. And I'm going to sum it up with Kirkus Reviews. They say something that Kristen and I totally agree with. They say Mary Kubica is a hell of a storyteller. Yes, she is. People Magazine says her books are hypnotic. Yep, that sums it up perfectly. She lives outside of Chicago with her husband and two children. And we're so happy to have her back with us today. Oh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And again, thank you for having me here. I do like you very much, both of you. And I've been just thrilled <laughs> that I'm back here, that you invited me back to talk with you again. That's great uh, news because we're coming for dinner on Friday. <laughs> yeah. I'm a terrible cook. <laughs> How cute. Um, well, Mary, we're here to talk about She's Not Sorry. And this is an edge of your seat thriller, but it also has a lot of depth to it. And I like to give our listeners just a little little bit of the background, what's going on in the story. I will not give away spoilers. So this might be a little short because there's a lot that we could spoil. We will never do that. Now in your story, Megan Michaels is a single mom to a teenage daughter, and they're going through all the things that teenage daughters and, you know, moms go through at some point in their lives. She's also a nurse though, in an IC unit unit at a hospital. Now, one day at the hospital, a patient named Caitlin arrives And Caitlin is in a coma. She has had a traumatic brain injury, a TBI. And the word is that she had jumped from a a bridge and had plunged uh, 20 feet to the train tracks below. And this is, you know, the part where Megan has always tried to stay a little bit distant from her clients or her patients. But this time she starts to get a bit entangled in the family story and in some of the visitors that come to see Caitlin. And this is a mistake. And as the book unfolds, we see where now Caitlin and her daughter are facing some lethal danger. Did you want to add anything to that background? You did a fantastic job, I have to say. It is, you're right, it's so hard to talk about this kind of book without giving too much away. Um, But I just, I think you did a fantastic job. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, we will jump in. Chris is going to kick us off. Everybody tells Kristen she does the best bios. And I'm I'm always thinking, yes, she wants to go on book tour. I've said this a million times. And I'll carry her, I'll carry her briefcase. <laughs> okay, well, I have to say I love the characters, Megan and her daughter Sienna. Their relationship was real. It's not easy ra- raising teenage daughters or sons. And top this off, Megan was divorced. 
We witness struggles for power, independence, and identity from both the daughter and even the mother. You also showed us the toxicity in parenting, over worrying or over obsessing. And as the writer, I had to ask you, why are these tenuous family relationships so relatable to we readers? And why is it so important in your story? Well, I will say, first of all, that I have an 18 year old daughter (laughs) who was probably 16 when I started writing this book um, or 17. So, you know, that relationship is very familiar to me. Half of the conversations that took place in this book could have taken place in my kitchen. (laughs) Um, But I think that, you know, these are very relatable, you know, family dynamics. And I think many of my readers will be familiar with them, regardless, you know, if they have sons or daughters or the age of those, their children. I think those struggles are just very real. And that's one thing as a writer that I always try to do is make my characters and those family dynamics or friendships um, just really relatable, very authentic, because I think that that is what is going to make the reader emotionally attached to the characters, just really feel invested in their story and want to see it through. Um, And, you know, it's with thrillers because obviously so much of it needs to be about the pace and the suspense and things like that. You know, there's a balance between creating these just really these characters that are full of depth and not letting it slow the pace and things like that. But um, it was just so important for me to get Megan right, because I think that, you know, it it was so important to me that readers see her as a very strong character that, you know, always puts her daughter first. Mm -hmm. And that's what we loved about her. Also, I felt like the relationships, the difficulty in relationships showed us that sometimes you can't see what's really going on in, in the story or the mystery because we're blinded by other emotions going on in our lives. And we can all relate to that in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. And Megan, you know, I mean, she's, she's got her hands full, you know, not only is is she, she's a single mother taking care of this teenage daughter, but she works in the ICU where she encounters these patients that come in in all sorts of situations. And, you know, Caitlin, of course, is no exception. Um, This woman, you know, Um, that is believed to have jumped from a bridge and is now in a concussion or in a coma, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, again, she lets herself get a little close to to Caitlin's family and friends that come to visit, mostly because her parents are there, you know, and and Megan has a lot in common with them being a mother herself. And so she sort of crosses that line. But yeah, all that all that emotion really, I think, just again, it adds an authenticity to the story. And it's one of those things, you know, none of us can detach ourselves from those different emotions, you know, when you're at work, you're still thinking about your family back home and and vice versa. So I think that it's just so relatable. Mm-hmm. So true. Mary, I want to ask you about another undercurrent in your story. Megan says this about her ex-husband, and this is a quote from your story. Because Ben, despite our differences, despite what's happened to us over the last few years, knows me better than almost anyone, even sometimes better than I know myself. He's seen me at my best He's seen me at my worst. Now, this sentiment really struck me. And I wanted to ask you, because exes have this connection in this history for the rest of their lives, you know, for better or for worse. And I wanted to ask you, do you think that Megan is looking at that ex relationship with maybe different eyes and maybe with an eye towards this is a relationship that can grow into something better? Yeah. And Megan and her husband were married for, for a very long time. They have a daughter together. So they have this, this rich history. And, and even though, you know, things have taken a turn for the worse, you know, and and they have separated, um, there's that bonds there that I think is unbreakable, especially because they have this daughter that they share and they need to, they need to see each other from time to time, you know, when Ben comes to pick um, Stan up and things like that. So they can't really escape one another, but yes, I think that that bonds is always there. And in getting divorced, I do think, um, you know, Megan finds a lot of fault with Ben, but I think she also sees some goodness in him. And there is, um, you know, wonderful experiences that they share that are still there too. So um, I think that she does see, you know, she she's not sure, like, is this, can this relationship evolve into a friendship or, or is it going to go the other way? Because there's some tension there too. Absolutely. And, and I loved looking at it as, you know, there's this common interest of our daughter and, you know, keeping the focus on what we have in common, maybe is the place to start building that relationship if it goes in that direction. Because as you point out, we don't exactly know which direction it's going into for a while. 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah. There are days that it seems like they're on the same wavelength and then days they're not, but you're right. Having that shared bonds of their daughter, you know, will always connect them in one way. Yes. And we all know the direction it goes, but we're not saying a word <laughs> listeners. So you've got to get the book. Now I have to ask you something else. The story had adults with hurtful pasts, some still making mistakes, still finding their way. Someone, I'm not going to say who, said, I am not a bad person. I just did something bad. It really caused me to pause and consider, can someone be a good person and do bad things? But maybe we're saying, what is the definition of bad? And haven't we all done something that might qualify as bad? Yeah. I mean, I think we have, you know, and, and to your point, it, you know, the definition of bad can vary, you know, bad could be a speeding ticket. <laughs> bad could be something far worse than that. Um, so, but I, I am a firm believer that no one is a hundred percent good or a hundred percent bad, you know, whatever your definition of them is. And that's a theme, you know, not just in this book, but many of my books, I have to say, you know, um, as I create villains, a lot of times, um, you know, we'll discover that, you know, they're a villain because, you know, some, their back is to a wall and they're doing it to protect themselves, or they're a villain because they're just in some, you know, horrible situation or, you know, they're, you know, because of a past that they can't escape or what, whatever, but it doesn't mean that they're just born bad or that they, you know, they're out to hurt people. There's oftentimes a reason for it. And I think that, you know, a lot of times in this, you know, in thrillers and suspense, we have characters that are like true psychopaths, but I think that that's so rare in our real world. There, there aren't that many psychopaths out there, you know, people that are just, like morally bad. Um, so I do, that's something that I love to explore. And then I think, you know, on the flip side, we have very, very good people that sometimes make rash decisions, you know, when they hurt people and they cross a line sometimes because their emotions are so, you know, invested or that, you know, there are just so many things I think that could happen. And so that line is blurred, you know, everybody is flawed, no matter how, um, you know, how, how good we set out to be. I think that there are times that we just can't be perfect. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Mary, let's talk about secrets. When secrets can only cause harm when they come out, uh, is it better to leave them buried? And I wanted to ask you, do you think that, as Megan says, they hold too much power over your lives when they stay buried? What do you think? Yeah. I, I think yes and yes. I think that number one, if there is a secret that is just is just going to hurt everybody, you know, no good can come of it. I think it should stay buried. I mean, I just, you know, it's one thing if lives might be changed for the better or if something good can come out of having that secret um, revealed. But if not, then there's just, it feels like there's no point, even though even though keeping it buried, wh whoever secret that is, you know, whoever is holding that secret is probably feeling buried by it. You know, it's still consuming their lives because keeping something a secret is hard. It takes effort and it sits with them. You know, it just sits there in their gut for all their lives and kind of eats at them. So that, that is hard, you know, um, but yeah, secrets, secrets are tricky little things for sure. And there's a pretty good one in this book. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're not going to say what it is, uh, but I did think going back to that idea of a bond, the people who know this secret have a bond forever. And yeah. it was another layer of, of relationship here that I thought was really interesting. So, well, before we let you go, we wanted to ask you, Mary, if you could share what's on your radar, if you're working on something next that you could give us a little clue about it. Yeah, I am working on something. I'm not too incredibly far into it, but I will say I'm, I'm really enjoying it, which, um, is, I enjoy writing most of my books, but there's always, you know, some are more difficult than others. And every now and then I'll sit down and kind of reread what I've written and there, you know, which is what I'm doing right now um, with the manuscript that I have. And I'm really enjoying it. So that's always such a relief to be able to go back and read something you've written and just feel really good with where it's at right now. Um, this is kind of a murder mystery. There's still a lot for me to figure out as I keep writing, but I will say that it's set in um, the remote north woods of Wisconsin. So I've taken it outside of Chicago. I actually have two families vacationing in neighboring cottages up Wisconsin when when um, somebody, a couple people ended up dead. So <laughs> I'll leave it there. And then the rest, um, I'm guessing maybe 2025 release, maybe. 
Excellent. Well, that sounds very intriguing. And we hope, of course, that you come back and talk with us. Uh, I love that you're back here for a second time. In fact, we've got some authors recently for a third time. We just love it because we just love talking about your style of writing and all the little things you weave into your stories. And they are definitely in this one. So I think your readers will love it. And I think new readers will also love it. Now, mm -hmm. readers, you're going to want to connect with Mary. You can find her at her website at marycubica.com. She is also on Facebook, on X, and on Instagram. And we want you to come back next year. We're going to, we're going to call you up and, and invite you over, but we are not going to show up at Friday at your house. Oh, come on, Kristen. Kristen. My cooking. <laughs> I was looking forward to that dinner. Thank you, Mary. So Thank nice you to see so you. much. It's been such a treat. Kristen, it is such a special thing, isn't it? When we get an author back here two or even three times. And I don't think I'm not exaggerating, exaggerating when I say that we feel like we know them then. Because we don't just talk to these people, we dive into some very deep, meaningful topics. And we sort of get a little bond with these authors, and we really do love our authors. Um, I had to ask you something. I really loved your first question, and a lot of our listeners could relate to this, where if you have a divorce situation, do you have a bond with your ex? Do you have a bond without kids, or is it the kids that keep your bond together? Well, there's always the shared history. So there's always going to be some mental and emotional space that is, you know, occupied by this person, even if there are no children involved. And, you know, you go to special places with them and you remember that years of your life may have been spent with them and you remember that. Um, but I do think that there are, you know, the ability to, to grow when you have that common bond of children, because you know, you're not getting back together. So you can remove that from the equation and just focus on those kids and that being your common interest. And I know a lot of people, myself included, who have been able to rebuild a bond of friendship going forward with an ex. And I think actually that can be a wonderful part of your life. I, I, I admire you for that. I think it's very admirable and I don't think it's common because I have other friends who are divorced who would like to do that, but it's absolutely impossible, or at least for them or whoever they're dealing with. So if you can do that, I think it's a wonderful thing. And it was a big part of this book. Yeah. Also relationships, parent and children relationships. And my kids are grown up, but I still have this terrible tendency. I don't know if you do to start to worry about or obsess over things, mostly at like two in the morning. I start worrying about, well, they're traveling here or why are they doing that? Or, and, and, and I've got to check myself and say, no, they're adults and try to not, not do that. But Mary showed us in the story how easily we can fall back into that worrying trap. Do you have that? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any parent that doesn't have that, even when your children are adults, right? And here in this story, there is an added layer of a lot of things were happening around the hospital and in the neighborhood where they lived. And it was constantly in the news. And, and I think that's what adds, adds to our worry. It starts ratcheting up when we see on the news, these horrendous stories that are going on all over the place. And, and you see that working on Megan's mind in this story. So I don't blame her for being a little bit of a helicopter parent or obsessing or worrying. She had reason to worry. Yeah, she did. How about the real world though, where you're just worried about them traveling? Now, this is more of my problem. And my son lives in New York City. My daughter works in New York City. So, you know, it's got some things to worry about there, but they're doing fine. So I've got to let that go. But that's what I loved about her book. There's such real life issues inside here that yes, you do relate to the characters. And one more thing, because this I thought was just, I can't get over this thing. I'm not a bad person. I just did something bad. I like what Mary said, um, nobody's perfect, yeah. but is that a true statement? Do you think is that, is that a true statement? I'm not a bit, can you do bad things and still be a good person? Let me flip it backwards. <laughs> well, I think, you know, certainly nobody is perfect, but the idea is, do you learn from the bad things you do? Or do you repeat them? Is this a pattern of your life and a behavior that you just keep falling back into and into and into? And so, you know, we can't judge people, but I think that's where we get into the realm of that's just not a good person because they are repeatedly harming people. 
you know, sabotaging relationships or engaging in destructive behavior that affects a lot of people around them. I don't know. Yeah. I think you summed it up there. I think you summed it up. And that's what I was hoping you would say that your definition of uh, doing bad things, are you just ruining a garden or crashing someone's car? Or are you, are you hurting people? Maybe that's the key in doing bad things. Are you hurting other people in the name of you believe it's right, or you're going to pronounce a sentencing and judgment upon them, or you're just mad at them. So you think you have a right to do hurtful things to other people. That's where the bad thing definition really matters. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I just thought it was fantastic from the start to the finish. You got anything else to add? No, I, but I, I'm going to add this. Mary likes to explore those gray areas. And we've seen that in a lot of her books. This one is no exception. And it causes you to really think, what would I do in those shoes? Would I act the same way? And I love that she always puts the reader in that position of wondering, what would I do? Right? Well, Listeners, readers, we are so excited about some of the authors, all the authors that we have coming up. And I want to give you just a partial list just to kind of pique your interest. We have Ashley Elston, Liza Palmer, Lisa Unger, Heather Gudenkoff, CJ Box, Benjamin Stevenson, Kate Quinn coming on with Janie Chang, Chang, excuse me. Christopher Reich, Amiko Jean, Bonnie Jo Campbell, J.D. Barker, Dervla McTiernan. We have Scott Carson, who also writes, you may know him as Michael Carita, Kate White, Lisa Wingate, B.A. Paris, Hank Philippi Ryan, Ramona Osabel, Jill Shalvis. Wow, that is a powerhouse lineup. We are so excited. And we listeners, we are growing. We've got you in 80 countries and territories, all 50 U.S. states. We're very excited about that. And 1,600 plus cities. You're coming back again and again because of these fantastic authors that we have. And so we love it. And we love that you are spreading our socials and spreading the word around. Until next time, listeners, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction. I'm sorry. My...